Well, amen. It's kind of the theme for today. Lord, we run to you. So no one else can help. We turn our eyes upon him. Seek after him. That's where we find our strength. That's where our help comes from. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. We looked at last week, seeking the Lord for his wisdom. We talked about the fact that there's a difference between clever and smart and wisdom from God. We can do things in a smart way, clever way, or we can seek God to do it God's way. And that's what we're going to talk about today, seeking God for his way. Seeking God for his way. His way is the only way that matters. We can do it God's way or we can do it wrong. That kind of narrows down the options, doesn't it? Because, see, we like options. We're humans and our flesh likes to... Uh, have options and give our own ideas and our own opinions and what do you think about this? Well, I think this. What do you think about that? Well, I think that. But there's only two options. There's God's way or the wrong way. That's really what it boils down to. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, or it might have been an email, I can't remember, it said, I would agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. Well, that's kind of how it is when you're talking to God. God can agree with you and you'd both be wrong. Or we can do it God's way. We can do a lot of things, we can come up with a lot of ideas, but it boils down to the fact we have to find God's way. What did God say? Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 1. And Abijah rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Asa, his son, succeeded him as king, and in his days the country was at peace for ten years. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. I want to say that again. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. So they built and prospered. In chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles in verse 1, it says there in the second part of that verse, Asa his son succeeded him as king, and in his days the country was at peace for 10 years. Something that I've heard discussed among us for the last several weeks now is peace. We want peace. I want to be able to come to church and have peace. Now, come on, y'all look at me like you hadn't said it. I ain't making this up. We want peace. We want to come to church and, and not feel tension between a brother and a brother or a brother and a sister or a sister and a sister. We want peace. But I want to tell you something. Peace at any cost is no peace. Now, what I mean by that is we can ignore everything that causes us the disturbance and say we have peace. Or we can fix what is causing the unrest and have peace. Here's the difference. At some point, I can ignore something long enough to the point I can't ignore it anymore. And then I have to, and there's not going to be peace there anyway. Or I can seek God to to give the answer, the solution to what is causing a lack of peace to give me peace. That is lasting peace if we continue in that vein. That's lasting peace. It said there that the country was at peace for 10 years. 
We want peace. That's what we keep saying. I want to have peace. But there are some things that we're going to have to do to arrive at peace. There are some things that are going to happen. That's what we're going to look at today. There are some things that we're going to have to do in our hearts and in our church to find peace. And as and I would dare say that it, this didn't come easy for Asa. Some of the things that we're going to talk about today, they didn't come easy. It was hard work to bring about peace. But it's worth it. It's worth it. You didn't get here overnight. You're not going to get away from it overnight. Asa didn't make the changes and come to a peaceful solution overnight. There were some things he had to do. You see, the nation of Israel had a long history of worshiping idols. They had a long history of sin in their midst. And it took Asa some time to go through and say, there's some things got to change. But at the end, God gave them peace. Question is, church, how bad do we want God's peace? Because peace at any cost is, is, it, is no peace at all when we're ignoring the situations. But peace that comes from God dealing with us and we doing what God said is real peace. It's going to be quiet this morning, isn't it? Chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles in verse 2 says, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. The problem we have among us at times is that I'm more interested in how you think it is or you're more interested in how somebody else thinks that it is and that it's right in our own eyes. Judges chapter 21 verse 25 uh, says that it's the very last verse the last chapter of the book of Judges, before there were ever kings. And the Bible says there were no kings in the land, and the people did what seemed right in their own eyes. The NIV says they did what seemed fitting to them. In other words, they did whatever they wanted to do. That scripture says that where there is no vision, the people perish. That means they cast off restraints. They do whatever they want to do. And judges are saying there was no king in the land, so they did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. It's whatever they wanted to do. Whatever seemed right to, to me, that's what I did. And you can't say anything to me. You can't judge me because you're doing whatever you want to do in your own eyes as well. That's what's going on. See, that's the culture we live in today. Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong because what you're doing is wrong too, and we'll just be tolerant of each other. I'll just do what I want to do. You do what you want to do. You don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. I won't tell you what you're doing is wrong. The problem is, is the Word of God. The Word of God causes us a lot of problems if we'll let it. It really does. Because if we do what it says, it starts messing up with what we want to do. Asa did what was right in the eyes of God. And see, we start looking around. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm right? Because if you think I'm okay, well, then we're probably all right. Or if I, can, if I can come up with enough people to agree with me, then we must all be right. Unless the book says it's wrong. Amen. Unless God's word says it's wrong, then we're all wrong. He did what was right in the eyes of God. And I'm going to tell you something, church. I know we're First Baptist Church, McAllen, Texas, but... It doesn't matter if the Southern Baptist Convention thinks we're wrong. It doesn't matter if the Texas Baptist Convention thinks we're wrong. If the Lord says we're right, we're right. Amen? This is God's word. Now, now before you get all offended at me, I'm Southern Baptist, been that way all my life. And I, I'm here, but I'm here because that's what God said. Are you with me? I believe I'd die for my family. I believe if somebody broke into my house, I'd die from trying to save my family. I believe in my heart I would die for the Lord Jesus Christ. At least it's in my desire that if I had to give my life for the word of God and the cause of Christ, I will do it. I won't die for the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm sorry. I just won't do it. He said, it said Asa did what was right in the eyes of God. We can all be in agreement and be wrong. What did God say? 
He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Now look at what he did. Here's some things. If we want peace, if we want uh, uh, the power of God, if we want the presence of God, here are some things that they had to do in their midst to bring revival to their nation. It says there in verse 3, 2 Chronicles 14, verse 3, he removed the foreign altars and the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah pole. It says there, first of all, that he removed the, high, uh, the, the uh, foreign altars. When they moved into the land of Canaan, these were altars that the Canaanites used to sacrifice to their God. Now, it doesn't necessarily say that they worshipped at these altars, but they left them there. They kept them there, foreign altars. They might have been used, but they were sitting there. It was foreign to the, matter of fact, Deuteronomy 12, as we studied last Sunday night, uh, gave specific instructions of what to do with the foreign altars in the high places. But they, le- they left them there. They were still there. And Asa went out and destroyed them. But, you know, we, we have some foreign altars in our churches today. We have some foreign ideas that are contrary to the word of God. We have some, some foreign thoughts uh, there's a book out right now that, that I'm really enjoying reading, and I recommend it to all of you. It's called Radicals by David Platt, pastor of a church in Birmingham. And the subtitle of the book, Radical, is Taking Back Faith from the American Dream. You know, the American Dream says you can be anything you want to be. If you work hard enough and you persevere, uh, then, then you'll be successful. The problem is the spiritual world doesn't operate like that. There are times the disciples obeyed God and got in trouble. The the spiritual world says that I'm going to depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We have defined our church's success by a worldly standard. It's foreign to the word of God. It doesn't say it in the word of God, but we've defined what makes others successful, what makes other things outside the church successful. We've brought a, a worldly atmosphere, a foreign atmosphere into the church house and that says if we can get enough people on a Sunday morning in one building for one hour, then we have a church. But that's not what the word of God teaches. There are, I would imagine, all over this country, large meetings with a great number of people taking in a lot of money that may not have anything to do with God. We cannot define success by worldly standards. We have to define the success by the word of God. That we, God's people, have been called by his name. We have given our lives to our Savior. We've counted the cost. He has washed us with the precious blood of the Lamb. And we've been forgiven of our sins. And we come into this place and worship a holy God. And then we leave this place to let a dying world that's going to hell know there's something different inside of us. That's what church is all about. Success inside a church should be defined by lives changed, not the number of people in the building. You want to talk about a church growth program, you let a person walk into a house of God where they're worshiping God, when they're seeking God, and they're begging God to pour his spirit out upon his people, and they see something going on in us that they can't find anywhere else. I'm going to tell you, they're going to go out and say, hey, there's something going on down there at First Baptist Church. I don't know what it was. I walked in the door, and I felt something I've never felt before. I've seen things I've never seen before. These people don't just talk religion. They believe it, and they live it. We talk about prayer, but do we pray? He said they removed the foreign altars. Foreign ideas inside the church house, things that don't belong, things, ideas and, 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 and things that, that aren't found in the word of God. A successful church should be defined by the lives that are changed. It says there also that they removed, he removed the high places. Now, Sunday night we talked about high places, how that when, uh, when they came into the land, these high places were places of worship, kind of like the foreign altars. But instead of just ignoring them, uh, if they did, uh, or tearing them down, they kind of blended the worship inside the high places. High places were generally places where they, they had pagan worship. But instead of separating that and tearing it down, what they did is they just set up another altar for Jehovah God. 
And when they would come in, they might would burn incense to the God of Moab or the Canaanite God. And then before they left, they might come over here and worship Jehovah God. And Deuteronomy 12, again, as I mentioned, it says very clearly, when you come into the land, you destroy everything that has to do with pagan idol worship. You destroy it all. Don't leave anything. But they didn't. They held on to it. But especially the high places. Foreign altars, we don't read a whole lot about, just a couple of times. But high places, all throughout First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we, we see the high places. Times when kings didn't uh, completely destroy, they would say the high places still stood. In the day of King Solomon that we talked about last week, the, his favorite, Bible says, he had a favorite high place. It was at Gideon where he liked to go and worship. He held on to it. And even times where kings made attempts, and even Asa, you will see in later verses where he says that, that he removed all the high places from Judah, but not in Israel. Israel kept them. They, they held on to them. For some reason, they loved it. They, they didn't want to sell out wholeheartedly. They didn't want to do everything that God had commanded. They did a lot. But they didn't want to do everything. He said they left their high places. Things that they held on to. They craved it. Longed for it. You know, we have high places. Places we don't want to give up. Things that we don't want to let go of. Even here in our body, in our church, we have high places. We have traditions that maybe have been ineffective for a long time, but it makes us comfortable. So we hang on to it. We keep striving and striving to make it work. We won't let go. Things that have lost their power long ago. Because you see, all throughout the scripture, we find that God uses different methods, different tools for the same message. He will change and twist and move and, and change how he does things, but we don't. See, we don't want to do that. We like comfort. We like comfortableness. Oh, y'all quiet this morning. We like to be comfortable. We don't like to change. Somebody, somebody told me that, I, you know, we just don't like to. I don't either. I don't like to change. But I can tell you this. It was not too terribly long ago in my life when I reached a comfort zone. I quit trusting God like I once did. I quit seeking God like I once had and depending upon him for my every move, for my every word. And God immediately grabbed a hold of my life. He changed my situation and put me into a situation that I had to trust him or I knew I wasn't going to make it. And that's the way every day ought to be lived. Every moment of our life should be lived in constant seeking, in constant dependence and reliance upon God. But see, what we do is we find something that worked one time, we write a book, create a formula, and we can't do nothing else. We do that same thing over and over because it worked one time, and we're just going to keep right on doing it, keep right on trucking, keep right on going. It may not have worked in years, but we keep doing it because it's our high place. We're holding on to it. It's comfortable for us. We don't want to change. There have been many times in the ministry I'd feel the Lord say to me, work on this area. And I'd go to talk about it. And, I'd, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Boy, they've been doing that for years. If you touch that, boy, they're going to be mad as they can be. You better leave them alone. Oh, come on. Some of you know you said it. Not to me, but you've, I'm sure you've said it in your heart. But they're sacred cows. How many of you heard that phrase? I've heard it all my ministry. I've been in the ministry 21 years this year. I've heard it all my ministry. You can't mess with that. That's a sacred cow. Well, that ought to tell you something right there. That ought to wake us up. It's a high place. It's more for us than it is for God. It makes us feel better. It makes us feel like we're doing something significant. When the truth of it is, my fulfillment ought to become just from simply obeying God. Simply doing what he's told me to do. Whether I see it or whether I not. See, we like tangible results. Because we can put our hands on it. And we can say, look at what happened. And we always give glory to God. Because, you know, we can't do otherwise. But in our hearts, we're saying, look at, what, look at what we did. We came up with that idea, and God blessed it, and look what happened. See, God's not looking for you to go do something that he can bless. 
He's looking to bless something that he sends you out to do. But we do that a lot. We go and do something and say, now God, please come bless this, come bless this. And God's saying, hey, won't you let me do it? I'll do it through you. God didn't call us to do things for him. He called us to do things in him. Him to do things through us. High places, things they didn't want to turn loose of. What are you holding on to this morning, church? You want peace? You want the joy of the Lord? You want to walk in the spirit? You're going to turn loose of the foreign altars. You're going to turn loose of the high places that you hold so dear and say, Lord, I'll walk out into the deep with you. I'll get in over my head. I'll trust you. But see, that makes us uncomfortable. But I'm gonna tell you something, church, till you're willing to get out of your comfort zone and trust God for every step, you may never see the power of God. The high places. And then he says, he smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. These were instruments of worship for the pagan idols. They were tools of worship used in pagan worship. Did I just say that twice? They were tools used by those people for pagan worship. That's what I'm trying to say. They were instruments inside their worship services. And he smashed them, tore them down. You know, we do that. We've created instruments inside our worship service. Sometimes we even worship worship. We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping how we worship the atmosphere of which we create, these little goosebump feelings that we want to have, these warm fuzzies. We worship that, and we're not really worshiping the Savior sometimes. We want it a certain way. We want it a certain style. I mentioned, I think I mentioned to the church Wednesday night that I've always been in favor of doing blended worship because you don't come to church based on what you want. When we start dividing things up, and I'm not saying that people are wrong who do that, but in my own heart and mind, what God has dealt with me about is when you start dividing things up with contemporary and traditional and blended, and I and, and, uh, even had somebody say you could do a bluegrass service, a cowboy service. I mean, you could do all kinds of services. But then we start coming to church based on what we want. And we start worshiping the way we worship. Worshiping the way we do things. Instead of worshiping the God, we came to worship. They tore those down. And then he said, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord, verse 4. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, to obey his laws and commands. I'm going to tell you, when you start getting the idols out of the way, when you start getting your preferences out of the way, when you start getting your opinion and your will out of the way, then you can see to seek the Lord and follow his ways and his commands. Seek the Lord. Seek him to know him, to follow after him. He commanded them, seek the Lord, the God of your father, the God who has cared for you all these years. He's brought you out of Egypt into the promised land. He's taken care of you. Seek him. Seek him. See, the danger is going to come, church, in that when, when we get on the other side and we start seeing God bless and Stephen God move, that danger immediately is going to be to Relax. Well, we got that whooped. And we quit seeking after him. But when we do, we start falling back into the same old traps. The same, I mean, come on, church, let's learn a lesson from the lives of the Israelites. Let's learn a lesson from the lives of the kings. When they sought God, they prospered. When they turned away from God and quit seeking after him, they failed and got into idol worship and brought judgment upon themselves. He said, seek the Lord. Now look what he said there. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah. And the kingdom was at peace under him. He was thorough. He didn't just take care of one little spot. He went through all the towns of Judah and cleaned them out. Would we allow God to do that for us this morning? Lord, seek my heart. David said, know my heart, know my way. See if there's any wicked way in me. Would we say that to God this morning? Lord, you search me. You try me. Look deep inside of me. See if there's anything in me 
that's not like Jesus. Oh, he went to every town. He didn't just stop with one place. He went through all the towns of Judah and cleaned them out. Have you asked God, Lord, dig deep into my heart. You know me better than I know myself. What am I holding on to? What am I trusting in besides you? What are some areas of my life you've been trying to put your finger on, but I don't want to hear it? He said, the kingdom was at peace under him. Oh, when you start cleaning out the well, folks, when you let God start digging deep into your life and cleaning you, there's peace. There's a peace that's unbelievable. The Bible says that God gives us peace that passes all understanding. You can't figure out, I shouldn't be at peace right now. My world's a mess. But he gives you peace because I can, oh, I'm telling you, I love it. When I can lay my head down at night, put my head on my pillow and know that I have done what God told me to do. I've been obedient to him. I've surrendered everything I know to surrender. I can go sound asleep and there's peace in my heart. Now look at what he said in verse 6. He said, he built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. Isn't that something? This is what I was referring to a moment ago. When we find peace, we just, I don't know about you, I just want to go, Whew, man, that's great. No more fighting. It's peaceful. And the tendency is just to give in and, and, and just rest a while. That's not what Asa did. Let's take a lesson from Asa. When they were at peace, he went to the, to the stronghold, the fortified cities of Judah, and he made them stronger. He went to what was already strong and strengthened it. And, and when you and I find a time of peace, it's time we need to start preparing and taking what, what is already strong in us and make it stronger. Build up the walls, the fortified cities. Make them stronger. But then look also what he did. In verse 7, of course, he said no one was at war with him. In verse 6, no one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. And I just want to remind you, it's God who gives rest. It's the Lord who gives peace. It's the peace of God that I long for. In verse 7, he said, let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers and gates and bars. The things that were weak, he began to strengthen. The things that were strong, he made stronger. But the things where the enemy had tore down the walls, he had torn down their defenses, he had destroyed their ability to resist, he began to build those back. And I'm going to tell you, in times of peace, we got to start rebuilding what is broken. we got to start building up the thing, the, our defenses, the security in us. Where he, he said in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And when you've done all to stand, stand therefore. That's what he's talking about here. They went to the places where they had been defeated before and they begin to rebuild, begin to fix those walls. Church, there's spots in us we've been defeated. There's spots in us that have been torn down. There are areas of us where we are defenseless. Let's take the time to seek the Lord and say, God, we want to rebuild those areas. I want to make those areas strong so when the enemy comes against us, we're able to stand against the wiles, the tricks of the devil. We can stand up and stand firm because we fix those areas. We let God show us what to do and we, we fix the areas that were broken. But I'm going to tell you, to do that is going to mean you're going to get honest with God to recognize where the weak areas are. You're going to have to get honest with God, swallow our pride, humble ourselves before the Lord and say, this part is broken. It needs to be fixed. Oh, I don't like to see that. I don't like to see it when God begins to show me, hey, you're weak here. Satan has easy access to you right here. But until we recognize it, until we admit it, until we repent over it and ask God to start building that up in us, we will always be resistless on that point. Oh, let's put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to stand. Now notice that last verse. Last part of verse seven. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him and he has given us rest on every side. 
So they built and prospered. Again, I want to tell you some things I've heard. We've been through hard times. We'll go through them again. We'll be fine. That scares me just a little bit. This church has been here since 1908. We'll be here till Jesus comes. I hope so. But I don't want to be just a, a building. I don't want to be just a body of people sitting here that has no life. I want to be a lighthouse. I want to be a place where people walk in the door and say there's something going on in this place. I want to be a place where when you leave here and you go out into the, to the, to the field to work, that people look at you and they may not know you, they, they may not know you're a Christian, but they say something's different about that person. There's something about them that I don't understand. I want to, I want to talk to them. They see life. We should be about life. People should see life in us. We, if, we're not, if we're not careful, we become arrogant and say, well, you know we're First Baptist Church? We've always been here. I'm going to tell you something, church. There's a city out here that needs God. He don't have to have you. He can win McAllen, Texas without you. But he wants you. He wants you. He longs for you. He longs to be what he, he needs to be in this church. He longs to see this church be what it should be, to be on fire for a holy God. I mean, I'm telling you something. People will come if they watch, to watch you burn if you're on fire for God. I'm telling you, we lived out in the country in Deville, Louisiana, and, and when a fire truck went by the church, we got in the car and followed it. Because we probably know the person whose house is on fire. We're going to go check on it. If nothing else, just to see it burn. I'm telling you, this world, if they walk into this church and they know we're on fire for God, they'll come just to watch you burn. But he said, the land is still ours because we sought the Lord. I'm going to tell you, church, peace don't come just because you want it. Revival don't come just because you desire it. They sought the Lord. And God made promises in his word, and we'll see them more as we go through the chapter 14. But he made promises in his word that when you seek him, he'll be found by you. We have to seek after him. It doesn't come just because you, you think it's a great thing and you want it to happen. It comes because we get on our face before God and say, Lord, I'm going to seek you, to know you, to walk with you, to learn who you are, and let you do through me whatever you want to do. He said they sought him, and he gave them rest on every side. He gave them rest because they sought after him. You want rest, church? You want to have peace, church? Seek the Lord. Find his heart. Find his mind. Know his way. Seek after him. And look what he said. So they built and prospered. They built and prospered. Oh, don't we want to see God build this place? Don't we want to see this place prosper? It's going to come because you, the church, the body of Christ at this church, sought God and asked him to do in you what needs to be done. As the old song says, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You have to seek God. We have to make up our minds, Lord, I'm going to remove the foreign altars. I'm going to get rid of my foreign concepts that don't apply from the word of God about church. We have to remove our high places, the things that we hold, traditions, and the way that we've always done things because we just don't want to change. We're comfortable. We don't want God to do something new among us. We just want to live in the same old uh, rut that we've always been in. But if we come to him and say, Lord, I lay it at your feet. I destroy the foreign altars. I release the high places. I smash down my, all my, my idols. And I seek you. And I want you to do what only you can do. We have to seek his way. And they built and they prospered. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
they that labor, labor in vain. Let's seek him today, church. Let's be willing to do whatever it is God said to know his heart and his mind. Let's stand together. With every head bowed and every eye closed. This morning, what is God speaking to you about? Has he put on your heart a foreign idea, a foreign altar that you've developed that he wants to smash today? Has he spoke to you about a high place that you're holding on to, you don't want to release? Today's the day. Let it go. Lay it at the altar of the Lord God Almighty. Let him destroy it in you. And church, let's seek God. Let's seek his heart. Let's seek his mind, his will, his way, his wisdom. I'm going to leave us in a word of prayer. When we finish, I'm going to ask you to come. Whatever God has spoken to your heart about today, you come. These altars will be open if you just want to come and seek God. You can lay it here, whatever burden you're carrying this morning. Whatever thing that's holding you back from being free in the Lord, you can lay it down here at the altar this morning. If you're lost, you can be saved today. The blood of Jesus can wash away your sins and make you a brand new creation in Christ. Maybe it's been a while since you felt the embers of revival burning in your heart. You want to come today and ask God to stir you up and set you on fire. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of sharing your word this morning. And Lord, I pray we be a responsive people this morning, an obedient people, not to me, but to your word. Whatever you speak to our heart this morning, Lord, we say we'll do it. We'll be obedient. Lord, you work and move in the hearts and lives of people. Lord, I pray for that one that's lost this morning. I pray for the Holy Spirit of God to convict them and draw them that be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As Brother Lance begins to sing, Brother Morgan's here, Brother Nathan's here, I'm here. The altars are open. You come, let's seek God today. He made a promise he'd be found if you seek him as they sing.